Islam is an honest reporter's kryptonite. Take a seasoned journalist on a groundbreaking news program and ask him to give you the simplest, most basic information about Muhammad and the Quran, that reporter will suddenly turn into the most pathetic, trembling, sniveling, cowardly, journalistic jellyfish you've ever seen in your entire life. I haven't any courage at all. I even scare myself. <laughs> Since all the Scooby Snacks in the world won't convince anyone in the mainstream media to flee the fortress of dimitude, the task now falls to viewers like us to demand some degree of journalistic integrity. We can do this by watching various news specials about Islam and exposing the endless supply of false claims and misrepresentations they assume we're too stupid to spot. If the networks start losing credibility over their dishonest reporting, if their inaccuracies become a source of embarrassment, maybe they'll be a bit more careful the next time they decide to do a puff piece on the religion of puff piece. Is my nose bleeding? <laughs> there are plenty of news programs out there in dire need of a good public flogging, and I intend to go through as many of them as possible in the coming months. But where do we begin? Well, to keep things simple, let's go alphabetically. ABC News masterfully demonstrated what we might call the frightened ostrich method of reporting in their 2020 special, Islam, Questions and Answers. Our questions about Islam were answered by Diane Sawyer, Bill Weir, and Lama Hassan, the three blind mice of primetime political correctness. Let's see how they run. We're just like everybody else. Being a Muslim in America, my opinion doesn't make me any different than anyone else. 110 percent American. If ABC had called this program what westernized Muslims believe, I wouldn't have a problem with Muslims saying we're just like everyone else. But this program is called Islam, Questions and Answers. ABC is supposedly giving us information about Islam, not about westernized Muslims who wouldn't know the Quran from a phone book. What does Islam teach about Muslims. Chapter 3, verse 110 of the Quran says to Muslims, You are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. Muslims are the best people in the world. How about Jews and Christians? Surah 98, verse 6 reads, Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, from among the people of the Scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. We are the worst of creatures. Muslims are the best of peoples. According to the Quran, then, are Muslims just like everyone else? Not a bit. ABC had a chance to explain this, but accurate information about Islam just wasn't a priority in their 2020 special on Islam. In the beginning, Adam and Eve. Though in Islam, God created them equally out of dust, not one from the other. Adam and Eve were created equally from dust, according to the Quran. Diane doesn't give us a reference for this lovely teaching, and she couldn't if she tried, because the Quran doesn't say it. What does the Quran say? Surah 4.1 O oh mankind, be dutiful to your Lord, who created you from a single person, Adam, and from him... Adam, he created his wife, Eve. Surah 7, 189. It is he who hath created you from one person, and out of him produced his wife, that he might dwell with her. If that's not clear enough, in Sahih al-Bukhari 33, 31, Muhammad said, Woman is created from a rib. Are men and women created equally from dust in Islam? Only if Diane Sawyer turns out to be a higher authority than Muhammad and the Quran. Good luck with that, Diane. And until Jesus comes, in the Quran he sits at the right hand of God. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. That's what Christians believe, but is that what the Quran says? Once again, no chapter, no verse. Why? because the Quran never says it. The Quran does say in Surah 355 and Surah 4, 158 that Allah raised Jesus to himself, but that's not the same thing as saying that Jesus now sits at the right hand of Allah. 
According to Muhammad in Sahih al-Bukhari 3430, Jesus is in the second heaven with John the Baptist, several heavens away from Allah, certainly not at Allah's right hand. And also in the Quran, the heart of Islam, Muhammad's five pillars. Sorry, Diane, but the five pillars don't come from the Quran. They come from the Hadith. You won't find the Shahada in the Quran. You won't find pray five times a day in the Quran. You won't find a list of five pillars in the Quran. I'm pointing this out because this is as basic as it gets, and you're not even getting this right. Now, the reality is that the vast majority of Muslims in the United States are not mosque-attending kinds of Muslims, and that's okay. It's okay for Muslims to do other things when they're supposed to be at the mosque? Seriously? In Sahih al-Bukhari 657, Muhammad was about to burn Muslims alive and burn their houses to the ground because they didn't show up for prayer. It seems Muhammad took this whole mosque thing pretty seriously. But not to worry all you Muslims who don't want to go to the mosque, ABC News has a thoroughly westernized Muslim woman telling you it's okay to ignore your prophet's commands. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. No source, Diane? No chapter and verse? I hereby invite anyone from any planet to show me where Muhammad said we should all be tolerant of each other's religions. Never happened. But Muhammad did say, fight those who believe not in Allah. O oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. I have been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah. O oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends, they are friends of each other. I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. I guess that's almost like telling people we should all be tolerant of each other's religions. As long as you live in opposite world with bizarro reporter Diane Sawyer. And after he died, history saw the first real interfaith era. For hundreds of years, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and atheists, uh, lived together, debated God, debated religion. Welcome to Fantasyland. Population, anyone who watches ABC News. According to Muslim sources, after Muhammad died, Abu Bakr went on a killing spree against all the people who tried to leave Islam because they'd only become Muslims in the first place to avoid getting slaughtered by Muhammad. Umar took over after Abu Bakr, and he forced Christians to sign an agreement, the Pact of Umar, saying they wouldn't build churches, repair damaged churches, sing loudly in their churches, or wear crosses. They had to give up their seats for Muslims, they had to feed Muslims, and they had to let Muslims sleep in their churches. And if the Christians ever violated any of these rules, the penalty was death. Over the next 14 centuries, more than 270 million people were slaughtered in the name of Islamic Jihad. Christians, Jews, Hindus, Zoroastrians, everyone who refused to become Muslims. And Diane Sawyer and ABC News whitewash all of it, describing life under Islamic rule as an interfaith paradise. It's kind of offensive, isn't it? Is it true, though, that those words should then supersede anything he said earlier? Not at all. In Surah 2, 106 and Surah 16, 101, the Quran says that later teachings abrogate earlier teachings. Not at all. Muhammad said that later teachings abrogate earlier teachings. Not at all. All classical Muslim scholars said that later teachings abrogate earlier teachings. Not at all. Who challenges the doctrine of abrogation? ABC News. So, there you go. 14 centuries of Muslim scholarship and reality itself get tossed out the window. While a fundamentalist Muslim follows Muhammad's instruction to fight the infidels, moderate scholars argue the infidels he was talking about were specific enemies that have been dead for 1,300 years. Wow. Muhammad's violent teachings only applied to a few enemies for a certain period of time. Of course, Muhammad didn't interpret it that way. The rightly guided caliphs didn't interpret it that way. Muhammad's companions didn't interpret it that way. Centuries of Muslim leaders and scholars didn't interpret it that way. 
But none of that matters, because world-renowned Quran scholar and theologian Bill Weir tells us that when the Quran says to Muslims, fight those who believe not in Allah, it doesn't really mean what it says. Maybe we can get Bill to write his own commentary. He could explain why 14 centuries of Muslims didn't understand the Quran at all. And the Quran only calls for jihad against invaders, threatening a Muslim home. I'll tell you what, Bill, I'll read the verse, and you tell me where you're getting confused. Surah 929. Fight. Fight whom? Fight invaders? No. Fight those who believe not in Allah. So, this is fighting people based on what they believe. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Does that sound like it has anything to do with fighting invaders? No. Do you know why? Because it has nothing to do with fighting invaders. It's a command to fight unbelievers. And when this verse was revealed, Muslims began their long tradition of offensive jihad, fighting to subjugate all non-Muslims. You won't learn any of this from ABC News, though. Is there anything in the Quran that promises 72 virgins for a, for a holy martyr? I don't see any evidence in the Quran for the pledge of 72 virgins. This notion of 72 virgins actually comes from a mistranslation, uh, with the real translation being 72 raisins. There are actually two separate errors here. Ursad Manji seems to think that the number 72 comes from the Quran. doesn't. That comes from the Hadith. Then she tells us the Quran doesn't say Muslims will get virgins in paradise. It says they'll get raisins. So the hordes of the Quran are raisins, not virgins. This is a mangled edition of an argument by Christoph Luxemburg. The main problem with Ursad Manji's claim is what the Quran says about these hordes. The Quran says Muslims will marry the hordes. It says the hordes will be chaste and beautiful. It says the hordes will have beautiful eyes and large breasts and that they'll love their husbands. It's fine with me if Irsad wants to translate hordes as raisins, but if she does, Islam just got a lot creepier. He says bestsellers like The Way of the Muslim are often quoted in place of the Quran and contain dangerous ideas. Which mean the blood money or the compensation for killing of the disbeliever is half of the blood money of the Muslim man. When you devalue the life of non-Muslims, that is the root cause of the problem. Terrorism is the last step. Now, this is just hilarious. Radical Muslims are quoting books in place of the Quran, and they're using these modern books to justify killing. What's the real source of terrorism? Devaluing the lives of non-Muslims by saying that the blood money for killing a non-Muslim is half as much as the blood money for killing a Muslim. How did these modern Muslim authors ever come up with such a horrible teaching? They got it from Muhammad, Sunan Abu Dawud, 4527. The value of the blood wit in the time of the Apostle of Allah was 800 dinars, or 8,000 dirhams, and the blood wit for the people of the book was half that for Muslims. Are you catching this? According to ABC News, the real source of jihad and terrorism isn't Muhammad's teachings, no. The violence springs from modern books by modern Muslim authors who, as you just saw, are getting their views directly from Muhammad's teachings. And radicals have used these murder and martyr myths. Murder and martyr myths. All this talk about jihad and fighting unbelievers and martyrdom, it's all based on myths. I guess that's why Muhammad said in Sahih al-Bukhari 2797, 
by him in whose hands my soul is. I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause and then come back to life and then get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred. Just myths. Dictators combine that resentment with a perverted version of Islam and manipulate their people with a holy hatred of America. Dictators use a perverted version of Islam to incite hatred against America. Let me break this down for you because a drugged monkey could figure this one out. Listen to the Quran. This is Surah 5, verse 33. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides or they should be imprisoned. Here we have various penalties for making mischief in a Muslim land, depending on the severity of the offense. The worst form of mischief making is bringing a non-Muslim military into a Muslim country. Has the United States done that? Yes, what's the penalty according to the Quran? Death. Do Muslim leaders need to pervert Islam in order to fuel hatred against America? No, they just need the Quran. A fatwa is nothing more than just one cleric's opinion. You could issue a fatwa that Coke is evil and you should drink Pepsi. Fatwas are a dime a dozen. They are meaningless. Fatwas are meaningless? No more than opinions? Fatwas are rulings by Muslim scholars based on Muhammad's teachings. They don't carry any additional weight beyond the quotations from Muhammad and the Quran, but they're definitely not meaningless. They contain the commands of Allah and Muhammad. Does the Quran teach the practice of al taqiyah lying to non-Muslims to advance and protect Islam? According to the experts, an obscure law called al taqiyah did allow early Muslims to deny their faith, but only under the threat of persecution. Recall the woman's question. Does the Quran teach the practice of taqiyah, deceiving non-Muslims? Unlike ABC News, I'll actually quote the Quran for you. Surah 3, 28. Let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoso doeth that hath no connection with Allah, unless it be that ye but guard yourselves against them, taking, as it were, security. According to this verse, which uses a form of the word taqiyah, meaning concealment, in order to guard yourself, Muslims are not allowed to be friends with non-Muslims unless they're outnumbered and they feel like they're in danger from a stronger adversary. That's when Muslims are allowed to pretend to be friendly. One of Islam's greatest scholars, Ibn Kathir, comments, In this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship outwardly, but never inwardly. Abu Darda, one of Muhammad's companions, put it this way, We smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. As for ABC's claim that taqiyah is just an obscure law for early Muslims, Muhammad's companion Al-Hasan said, Taqiyah is allowed until the day of resurrection. So Muslims have a choice. They can either go with the Quran and Muhammad and Muhammad's companions and Islam's greatest scholars and deceive us by smiling in our faces while cursing us in their hearts, or they can go with ABC's Bill Weir, who, although he knows next to nothing about Islam, does do a remarkable impression of Putty from Seinfeld. Is Islam inherently violent? Yeah, that's right. Does Islam oppress women? Yeah, that's right. Does it advocate barbaric punishments? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. right. Savage. A chimp's all right. I find. The Quran is very, very clear that in the eyes of God, men and women have equal rights and equal responsibilities. Surah 4 3 says that men can marry up to four women. Do women get to marry up to four men? No. Surah 4 24 says that Muslim men can have sex with their female captives and slave girls. Do women get to have sex with their male captives and slave boys? No. Surah 434 says that men can beat their wives into submission. Do women get to beat their husbands into submission? No. So do men and women have equal rights and responsibilities in the Quran? No. 
men and women are about as equal as hammers and nails in the Quran. At the Prophet Muhammad's own beloved first wife, uh, Khadija, was a wealthy, self-made entrepreneur. Now, Irsad Manji is correct when she says that Khadija was a wealthy entrepreneur. So that's not an error. The error is that Irsad uses this as proof that men and women are equal in Islam. And here she's just being silly with her timeline. Khadija was a wealthy entrepreneur before Islam, before she married Muhammad, before Muhammad received his first revelation. So what does her status as a businesswoman tell us about Islam? Absolutely nothing. If we want to learn something about women in Islam, let's listen to someone with a little more experience of life with Muhammad. In Sahih al-Bukhari, 5825, Muhammad's child bride Aisha says, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. According to Aisha, the mother of the faithful, the believing women, the Muslim women, were suffering more than the pagan women. And by the way, the context of this quotation is that a Muslim man had beaten his wife until her skin turned green. Aisha was complaining about Muslim women being brutally beaten by their Muslim husbands. She realized that non-Muslim women were much safer because their husbands didn't have a revelation from God advocating spousal abuse. But this doesn't matter at all to ABC because Muhammad, 15 years before he declared himself to be a prophet, married a rich old widow. Guess that settles things. And reminding us that all the peaceful American Muslims are part of America's first line of defense. Yes, moderate, peaceful Muslims are our first line of defense against those pesky extremists. Muslims are violently subjugating Christians and other religious minorities in Egypt, Iraq, Pakistan, Sudan, Nigeria, and everywhere else Muslims have power over unbelievers. Are all the peaceful, moderate Muslims stepping in to protect these non-Muslims? Are the peaceful, moderate Muslims the first line of defense for victims of Muslim aggression? Certainly not. But Diane Sawyer and ABC News are convinced that things will be different here in the U.S., where moderate groups like CARE constantly tell Muslims not to work with police or the FBI in locating and apprehending terrorists. By the way, there was a bonus blunder in the clip we just saw. Notice that ABC showed us a picture of Sadiq Abdul Malik, who, according to Diane Sawyer, is one of the moderate Muslims always prepared to protect us from extremists. Sadiq supports Revolution Muslim and the Taliban. He defended Nadal Malik Hassan after the Fort Hood massacre, and he calls for the destruction of Israel. But hey, I'm sure he's quite ready to save us from all the radicals he supports. It's my duty as an American Muslim to stand between you, the American non-Muslim, and the radicals who are trying to attack you. It's a Muslim's duty to stand between us and the radicals who are trying to carry out Muhammad's commands in the Quran and the Hadith. I'll tell you what, Imam Rauf, you show me that anywhere in the Quran or authentic Hadith and I will personally help you build a mosque at Ground Zero. But you won't show me because you know this isn't what Islam teaches at all. In areas where Muslims make up a majority, the duty of Muslims is to violently subjugate all non-Muslims. In areas like the United States, where Muslims are in the minority, the duty of Muslims is to practice taqiyya, deceiving non-Muslims into believing that Islam is peaceful and tolerant. But you know this, Imam Rauf, because that's what you do for a living. And the lovely folks over at ABC News are all too happy to serve as your megaphone. I would dance and be merry, life would be a ding a dairy if I only had a brain. Well, that's 20 errors in an hour-long news program, and I could have pointed out more. Isn't it sad that if you want accurate information about Islam, you have to get it from the internet? Because the major networks and their research departments with their endless trunks of money just can't seem to get anything right when they talk about Islam? If this were any other topic, and ABC News made this many mistakes, 
they lose all credibility. But since the topic is Islam, it's perfectly acceptable to broadcast total nonsense in an effort to make Islam sound better than it really is. ABC News, like so many other networks, is a taqiyya amplifier. Muslims come up with soothing lies, ABC pumps them into your living room. If you're as fed up as I am, I invite you to send this video to as many people as possible. We need to start holding networks accountable for misleading and deceiving their viewers, and we can do this by drawing attention to errors and correcting them. I guess the only question now is, who's next? Oh yeah, we decided to go alphabetically. So, what comes after ABC? BBC. Stay tuned.